Today's episode of The Mom Game is brought to you by our friends at Gateway Buick GMC at LBJ and Jupiter. I know that buying a car can be stressful, but not at Gateway because their slogan is Gateway's Got It. And just what does that mean? Well, it means Gateway got, Gateway's Got a wide selection of new Buicks, GMCs, and GM certified used vehicles, all competitively priced. Gateway's Got It. In these busy times, you want a car dealer who makes things easy and convenient. Well, guess what? Gateway's Got It. When you log on to GatewayBuickGMC.com, look Look for the shop, click drive button. This allows you to shop from the comfort of your home and who doesn't want that? In fact, it's as easy as one, two, three. One, select your vehicle. Two, create your offer. Three, schedule your delivery. And on top of all this, Gateway Buick GMC offers complimentary, that's free, car washes for life. So when you want a dealer who has it all, Gateway's got it. You can find them online at gatewaybuickgmc.com or shop in person at LBJ and Jupiter. GMC, we are professional grade. Experience the new Buick. And welcome to episode 128 of The Mom Game. I am Emily Jones. She is Julie Dobbs. We are back together in our Power Blazers. Power Women Blazers. Look at us. We're like, look at us go. So. Fancy and professional. I feel, I, I feel like my person, my person doesn't match well with blazers, <laughs> oh my but I love them. I'm so, yeah, I do too. It's doing the best it can to help this old soul out. I picked this color specifically because it matches with the wine I'm drinking. <laughs> I need a rosé. Um, you do need a rosé. Oh, it matches my hair though. It does match your hair. Um, Yeah. Super fun new partnership with mm-hmm. our, our friends at Power Woman, Uh Blazers, really cool story. We're going to tell you more about them in the weeks to come. This is just kind of our little teaser um, to tell you about this spoiler. The spoiler alert with Power Woman Blazers is these blazers have pockets. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole cool story behind it that we'll get into. Lots of pockets, very functional. Pockets, pockets, functional. Yeah. So this is our little teaser. We just want to show you our new threads. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we're going to tell you more about them um, in the weeks to come, social media wise and here on the mom game. But yeah. we're excited to to be wearing them, making me feel a little more powerful than official. I really do in life. We're so I, because I don't feel, um, I don't feel very, I, I don't either. I feel so beaten down right now oh, in my life. Like, but in a blazer, you cannot. No, I mean, I down. listen, I felt blazer people have their shit together. I felt. 85% beaten down before I put this blazer on. And now I'm just at like 48%. Okay, good. It's helping. <laughs> Automatic power. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, back to school. It's the dog days of summer in the baseball season. The Rangers are firing my friends <laughs> left and right. Um, yeah. You know, we're not going to the playoffs. It's, you know, it's the end of the season. I'm trying to build a house, trying to stay married, keep, uh. keep some kids alive, like all the things it's just, I feel like it's just a lot. Like it's an adjustment period for kids, right? Their sleep schedules, all that is completely out of whack. Yep. They're just exhausted. Exhausted. And home. we're I feel like we're the same too. Yeah. You know? It's hard know. on parents. Shit's hard on parents too. I feel like it would the right thing to do with our kids when they go back to school, which nobody does and nobody can do, it would almost be like cancel everything. Like let your kids come home, give them food, let them sleep. Put them to bed early and maybe they'll be normal functioning humans. But nobody does that and oh, nobody yeah. can do that because we yeah. all have lives, whether you work or not. Go. Right? We got, we got, we got practices, like the, after school activities. All, we got oh, all of it. Everything, everything. And they, these poor kids are just like trying. And mine are younger. So I think it even takes a bigger toll on them, like going back to school and, and just kind of exhaust them to the core. But does anyone do the whole let's get in the back to school routine a week early and start going to bed at X time and I don't think get so. up at X time. I think it's all talk. No, there we don't, I mean, we don't even come close we to try doing that just for like the weekend before right. school, like for two days. Cause yeah, you we know, just did the night before school. There started. you go. Yeah. It's like yeah. kids are resilient. They'll mm. figure it out. <laughs> That's what we always say. That's my favorite thing to say. The whole fucking world is crumbling around you. (laughs) Kids are resilient. They can handle it. They're never going to remember this shit. It's going to be fine. A pandemic, wearing masks to school, telling everybody that germs are going to kill them. (laughs) They won't remember any of it. They'll be fine. They'll be totally fine. They'll be fine. Yeah. Um, it's, It's a lot. It's a lot. 
That's but school's all. going well for them. They're- yeah. I mean, they're good. You know, yeah. they're good. It's, we're just getting in that groove. And yeah. two, for me, it's, it's the same way because, um, when I, when school starts, so then I try to get my workout in before the kids get up. Mm-hmm. So my goal is to log, you know, how many ever miles before my kids, it's time for them to get up. And so that's an automatically adding, you know, at least, you know, an hour or two to my day to mm-hmm. where I, now I'm setting an alarm. I'm, you know, it's, yeah. so it's different. So it's an adjustment for me yeah. too. Um, so you don't, you don't adjust your workout at all. You just try no, to get up even earlier. I'm just trying to get up. Cause that's, just, uh, yeah, you know me. Yeah. I'm crazy. AF. So I, yeah, I'm just, yeah. So I'm, it's not every single day, but yeah. So, so it's five 30 wake up call in the morning, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. so which means I need to go to bed earlier. I know. Which Easier means said than done. Less of this Or just at start night. this earlier. <laughs> or just start it earlier. That's another option. Like um, if there's going to be a four window of wine, we'll just move that up a bit. Just, <laughs> yeah, just, just, just start at two. Adjust accordingly. Turn it off at six. <laughs> Go to bed at eight. Oh, it makes perfect sense. I know, I know. So I do sense. have to tell the people a little Uh-oh. bit why I'm super pumped. Okay. And why we are... Why we're power women today. Power it up. And why we're having our pregame glass of wine. Because we are having our dub launch party tonight. We are. Very exciting. I think everyone's heard us talk about dub on here a few times. Um, and it's going it's going real well. All those dudes are going to all be in one place tonight, which in, is a feat in itself. Getting everybody there. And we're going to have our little party up in McKinney um, at a sports bar kind of place called Chop Shop. And then... It's a good person, I think, for us to know for the mom game. And maybe we, we hope to have more mom game parties like in the near future, too. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm super pumped to see everybody and even just like to hang out with you for a night. Yeah. As much as we see each other, we don't really well, go party. We don't get to hang. Um, but I want to say to you, I'm so proud of you. Mm-hmm. I know how hard you've worked on this um, right. on the Dub Network, I, how hard you've worked to get everyone coordinated and assist these guys who are fairly new in the broadcast realm. Yeah. Some, but not all, um, have some experience, but this, the podcasting thing is a different thing from television, which some of these guys are used to. It's just a different beast. And you've been there to hold their hand. Um, you've put in so much work and I am just really, really proud of you and all the work that you've put in. And, uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. I'm thankful that you've allowed me to be a part of it. I've tried to focus a lot of my energy on the mom game. So hopefully you don't have to worry so much about that. Yeah. But, um, which is huge and you're killing it on um, the mom game, but I'm just really proud of you. Well, thank so you. if we can just be sappy for a minute, I'm um, really, I really appreciate proud of that. You, it's, it's fun seeing ideas come to life. Yeah. You know? And that's all this was, was another idea. We felt had something and trying to make it happen. And, um, I wanted you in on it too. Yeah. I feel like we have a great working relationship and mom games going well. And let's try this other thing too. And, and the fact that you're in on it too, it's like, you understand if it's pulling me a little bit from this, um, but not, not too much, hopefully. No, not at all. But, not at all. Um, but, but no, just... I, I think it's going to be fun. I'm excited that you're involved. Um, and we'll just well, see I'm where just it excited all goes. That, like, I think we're going to get a big boost once baseball's over. And yeah. we've got him, like, you know, yes. moving and shaking. Yes. So well, and I think, too, it's it's flattering to us that we're kind of considered a little bit of a prototype. Like, yeah. we kind of, we, I mean, we're kind of faking it sometimes. Like, ah, oh, we got to make it. Um, but I think we've figured some things out and we can help others along this path. Mm-hmm. Uh, same way with Mandy Tatum and Ad mm-hmm. Living Life, yep. her podcast. I'm going to be on with her next week. Oh, good. Um, so yeah, I feel like it's fun to help people get into this space because we've had so much fun with it. Yep. So exactly. Um, and it's yeah, the, I'm, it's the way that things are going in media. It is. Like, it let's is. Keep them churning out. Very much so. People very much so. Podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. So and yeah, so, no, it, it'll be fun. Yeah. Super proud of you. Grateful to our friends here at vocal who have kind of nurtured this thing yep. along the way as well. Um, we're the, the vocal family is definitely growing by the day. So yep. it's a, it's a, lot it's of a fun. good little family to be a part of. Yeah, it is a good family to be a part of. All right, let's get to some TMG news da- desks. News uh, well, Dak? Is he news, on the news desk? News Dak. It's not that I know of. Yeah. Uh, news desk slash what's on your feed. Cause I feel like it's consumed all of North Texas Yeah. for those not in the North Texas listening area. Um, You've probably seen about it too. Shit's been crazy as far as the weather. Is concerned. Missouri yeah. been texting oh, me. It's ridiculous. Uh, and that segment of our show is brought to us by our friends at Bottle Rover. Bottle Rover. We are so grateful for you um, for being a part of the mom game. 
If you don't know about Bottle Rover yet, you are missing out. First, just make sure you have that Bottle Rover app on your phone. It's basically um, a way that you can get wine, beer, liquor, whatever you want at your fingertips. And I don't really know what's better than that in this world. <laughs> did I say that? You did. Um, it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to admit it. I mean, my kids and everything, there's some things that are better. But wine, beer, and liquor at your fingertips is pretty dang awesome. Um Bottle Rover will help you save time. They will help you save gas, which we all know is not cheap right now. You can get your drinks delivered for free with Bottle Rover. The coolest part about it is there's a lot of cool parts about it, but it's a $50 minimum order, which is so easy to do. As we all know, a couple bottles of wine, one big bottle of tequila, you're done. You get that thing for free delivered to your doorstep. You might need a little more support right now because kids are back in school. Um, and it's just not that easy to get out and about and go to the liquor store. So no sweat. Bottle Rover and the mom game are here for you. We are the vehicle to communicate their message to you because we know that this is useful for you guys. Bottle Rover will deliver your favorite beer, wine, and liquor for free when you spend $50. Thank you. Bottle Rover. Thank you, Bottle Rover. Okay, so I feel like we're like old people talking about, like, can you believe this weather? It's just so crazy <laughs> yeah, out there. Yeah, but this one is crazy. Legit. I mean, yeah. it's so insane. Uh, it's like feast or famine. We're, yeah. you know, we're so hot, so dry. There's like fires breaking out. And then all of a sudden the heavens open up and dump on us for like 36 straight hours. I think maybe the heavens opened up because so many people were praying for rain. You think? Like, I think maybe too many prayers for rain. Too many prayers? <laughs> yeah. And the heavens were dancing. just like, all right, yes, <laughs> we'll do it. We got you. We got you. But yeah, it's been legit flooding in Dallas. I know. Like, I didn't, it's so weird. Like, I heard Fort Worth got hit hard. It did. It did. Flooding is just so weird. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like, no, I want to hear you explain. Well, yes. <laughs> Keep going. Please go on. <laughs> well, so like, for example, like a girlfriend of mine texted me and she's like, just trying to get through today. And she sends me this video and she's like sweeping water out of her office. And I was like, how did, yeah. I mean, like why like, some places and are not you others? in a floodplain? Like, yeah. how does this happen? And then you get on social media and you see, you see that one poor girl who she, she just saw her into the apartment. She was crying. She's she's in like you two come feet on the of mom water. I think her name was like Brittany. Something. Brittany, yes. Come and she had cry with this... you. Have a glass of wine with us. I'm so sorry you lost I everything know. in a freaking random ass flood. And I don't. It's I don't think it's like a rare. Th I think there's a lot of people that have been affected by this. But I I don't know if they're again. I don't. Again, We're entering the dumb zone. And I'm is so weird. I'm a resident. Like, did we not have proper drainage in place? So. Or is it just that like, this is so much that you don't, you can't plan for this. I think, both. and you just like, I think oh, both. I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that it doesn't rain. We got way too much rain. 12 all at inches once. in 24 hours. Yeah. Way too much rain all at once. I did hear before it started pouring. I heard some theory that made sense to me at the time. It's like when it's so dry, that it's it too dry to too soak dry it up. To soak it up. And so it just kind of like starts to to pile on top of the earth instead of getting soaked into the earth. Um, so the I think there's mom something, game there's where something you to laugh. The mom game is where you come to learn about the earth science and the earth and flooding. Uh huh. Now I don't understand why <laughs> I don't understand why some places are like completely underwater and some aren't. <laughs> I know. Like, <laughs> like are is we it, shaped like this? Right. Is it because you're high <laughs> or you're low or I just don't understand it. Like I get fires, right? Like fire is fire. It spreads around. Like, if yes, that is you, exactly what fire <laughs> is. If you light something on fire, it's going to burn. Yeah. And then it's going to spread until you spray water on it. Yes. I don't understand flooding. I don't either. I don't understand it at all. And like, how can certain places, <laughs> spots in a highway flood are they just lower? Is it this basic and elementary? I mean, am I this dumb to where, how can certain places that's on what a I, highway that's flood? That's what I'm saying. I don't understand any of it. I don't either. It's, it's, it flooding well, scares me. Yeah. You will never catch me fucking around trying to drive through the rain. No. Did you drive it all yesterday? I will drive through the rain. You, if, if I see like standing water that, you know, I can't see the stripes on the road, you better 
make damn sure I'm turning around. Yeah. My ass is not, I mean, I saw this one dude on, again, on social media. On our feed. He's like writing, he's like writing out the window of his car and his car's like floating down a highway. And I'm like, at that point, I'm, or do you abandon the car or is the car your flotation device? Like there's so many questions I have (laughs) about flooding that I'm not taking the chance. Yeah. I'm not taking the chance. Yeah. So turn around, don't drown. That's what it was. I was going to say that. Turn around, turn don't around, drown. Don't dry. Don't. Turn around, don't drown. <laughs> don't, or drive How about this it. one? Don't drive. Just survive. <laughs> okay. I like it. You can have that, Texas. I, hey, TexDot. Are you listening <laughs> to our girl, Julie? Don't drive. Just survive. Just survive. Okay. So, yeah, I did drive, like, locally. I drove around, like, my area yesterday. Uh-huh. Um. And then I it just it did make me laugh because your your friends at the ticket brought up a good point about are you umbrella pro umbrella mm-hmm. or no umbrella? Yeah, they're um, all idiots. God, no umbrella. Yes. So I I went no umbrella one trip. I had to run some forms to my kid's doctor so they could take drugs at school, basically. Uh-huh. And um, I was like, this it's like it's fifteen yards. <laughs> Like, I don't want to get them to be out. Tough guy. So I get out, run across, get dumped on. It's freezing <laughs> in the doctor's office. I'm cold AF, run out back to my car. Then I'm drenched. Mm-hmm. Then I've got the heater on high. It's 80 degrees outside, but I'm freezing. And I'm like, why didn't I just carry my umbrella? So then I stopped at the grocery store. Then I did the umbrella. So mm-hmm. I, I you am, have to assess each situation. Yes. But I do decide. feel like I'm pro umbrella. And I feel like the older I get, the more umbrella I am. Oh, uh-huh. the more pro umbrella. You're growing into the umbrella. I do. I feel like it's kind of a, it's, it skews older. Yeah. I get and back in my younger days. It's like, I don't need an umbrella. I hate being wet like that. Well, I will I run hate in getting the rain. splashed. If I'm not in a pool and someone's splashing me, I hate it. I got if s- I'm walking and the sky is splashing yeah. me, I hate it too. Yeah. So if there's a thing that'll help, my problem is not having the umbrella when I need the umbrella. I have nothing against the umbrella. You, you should keep an umbrella. In your I'm car. umbrella. You guy. have a lot of shit in your car. You should make I an umbrella know. part of it. <laughs> I know. Although we just got it cleaned out after Did our you? road trip. There's okay. not much in there right now. Yeah. Put but it. Yeah. I have an umbrella in my console. I have it in there. Okay. Now it's like a super. Okay, like, so it's there. So you should use flimsy. it. Yes. No, you're right. I should. Yeah. If it's yeah. taking up precious real estate in your car, because I know you don't put much in there. I don't. We like, made the cut. I have a big console. You got to use that thing. A big console. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, we forgot to talk about it at the top. We have um, a really special guest. Our, it's prayers not, are, our prayers are with everybody. If I pray, yes, our prayers are obviously like at least one person died, which that's terrible, which is why. Oh, God, I know. Turn around, don't drown. Don't turn try around. to drive through that shit. Yeah, don't drive, just survive. Um, don't drive, just survive. Um, we have a very special guest coming up. Yes. You were not a part of this. Oh. Um, you weren't a part of it. I'm just laying it out there. Of what? The The guest. Oh, the, oh the sh- I thought you were talking about our sponsor. No, that's on the show. Okay. But we're not ready for that yet. We've got one more thing to talk okay. about. I was but not I do I want to tease ahead because she's a kick ass guest. Oh, oh, I see what you're doing. I see you see what I'm very, doing. Very a very forward tease. Very forward tease. Gotcha. Um but it and I'm gonna t- say who it is because I'm really excited. I want people to stick mm. around for it. It's Jane Slater of the yeah. NFL Network. Yeah. And Jane and I have a really funny story of how we met. Okay. Um, and she is just effing slaying it on the NFL network. Uh, so proud of her. And she's super honest about she's single. Um, she was married like for a hot second years ago. And, um, she's so honest about like what it's like doing this job as a single woman trying to date, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, she's super candid. She's fantastic. And I hope that all people will listen to her because she's First of all, she's in, enlightening and she knows her shit as far as football and the Cowboys are concerned, all that. But she's just so real and so honest yeah. that it was a really fun conversation I got to have with her when you were out of town. And I'm, so I'm excited, excited to, to hear to it myself. I'm yeah. sad I missed it, but yeah. um, but I'm glad you got her on and that y'all were able to have that kind of heart to heart. It, yeah, because there's probably a, a lot there that can be talked about. Yeah, we had a ton of fun. OK, so before we get to Jane, we got to get to sports courts because right after we taped last week's show, when Chris Woodward was fired from the Rangers, then we find out, I think it was right after the show, I think, yeah. that John Daniels was yeah. just relieved of his duties um, for the Rangers. And I will say, I mean, obviously, I, I, I hated losing Woody. Um, you know, he was a dear friend and I loved working with him. But J.D., J.D. has been with me 
since day one. I mean, yeah. we kind of grew up in this organization together. And um, to be brutally honest, he was kind of like a security blanket for me. Like I always, and I texted him this and we talked about it. Like I've always had him in my corner um, from the very beginning. And yeah. that was a very comforting feeling to have knowing that you had, that I had him in my corner. Yeah. Now that didn't mean he always agreed with everything I said, everything I did. Um, we had a very, very still do have a very good relationship as far as being honest and open with each other and, um, not afraid to, to tell each other what's up. And I, I think that's what made our relationship so great. Our working relationship so great, but that one, it hit me hard. Yeah, um, I, I was imagine. like, wow, that's, and just, he, he'd been the GM for 17 years. He had been in the organization for, I want to say maybe 20. Cause he worked under John Hart, um, before he took the GM job. And I mean, you know, he, and he withstood so much criticism, um, you know, after those world series teams and kind of that whole honeymoon phase wore off. And, you know, it, as his friend, it was hard for me to, to hear those criticisms and, and see him have to endure those, but it's part of the job. He knew it. Um, and so he's handling it really well. He's got a really great attitude. The statement he released was freaking ridiculous pro top notch high road said all that the day he after was getting ridiculous essentially fired. And right? he's been great. Yeah. I mean, we, we text back and forth and he's, I mean, he's doing great, but I think I have him talked into coming on the mom game. I think fingers huge. crossed. Um, I feel like we could just have a really good. I do too. I do too. And I conversation. think we're close enough to where if we asked him anything that he didn't want, he didn't want to go there. He's just going to tell me. Yeah. Um, and so my hope is that we can have JD on. Cause I feel like it would be a great conversation. I feel like there's so much about him that people don't know mm -hmm. that I think I would love for them to know as his friend, mm -hmm. um, especially now that, you know, he's he, his time with the Rangers is over. I would love for people to know some of those things. He never sought out attention or whatever. Um, if I if I my hope is that he will come on. I hope um, so, too. I you bet know, it, I'm sure he will. And I told the story on the broadcast about, you know, my affiliation with the Do It For Durant Foundation. Um, JD was the driving force behind that. Mm. Um, and the things that he did for Richard Durant's family in the hours and days after Richard died is completely is really? so, Oh, he arranged for them, arranged for them to be flown back. They were in California when oh. Richard died, Kelly and the kids were, he made sure they got back. He made sure that we kind of mobilized to get that fundraiser together, to raise money for Kelly and the family. Wow. Uh, he made sure that we started a nonprofit to keep uh, Richard's name alive at the request of Richard's widow, Kelly. Wow. Um, that's, he's a, a, that's above and beyond he's a good yeah. dude. And yeah. I, I realize it's sports and people don't want to hear that shit. And they just want to know about how many championships you've won and who, what players you're acquiring and what moves you're making and all that kind of stuff. I get it. It's part of the job, but also too, there is a lot to John Daniels that I would love for people to know about. And, you know, I may sound like a, a Homer, but I don't give a shit. Like he's, he is, he is, a, he is my friend. Yeah. Um, again, doesn't mean that I agree with everything he did, everything he does and vice versa. Yeah. Um, but he's a friend and he is a good, good human being. It's like so. anybody that's worked with anybody at it, whatever workplace for that long, yeah. you become friends. And when one of your friends goes away, it's sad. Yeah. And so that's the human in you. So right. you become friends because you, they're good people. Yeah. You don't for, become friends because he's an asshole. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so anyway, it's my hope that we can get him on. I hope so too. I think it'll happen. Yeah. I hope so. But, um, but yeah, what's the, I mean, was, was he shocked? Can I? So, okay. Th this is what I've said to a million people. This was the end game the entire yeah. time. This was the plan. And he kind of knew for, no, well, it was his, this is what he wanted to happen. Oh, just not this, yeah. not this timing. He, the whole, the plan, the entire time JD was instrumental in bringing Chris young in. He wanted Chris young to be the guy to take this thing over. It just it may be at the end of the season, <laughs> yeah. maybe at the end of next season. So the timing of it, yes, caught everyone by surprise. It was very abrupt, but this from the beginning was the plan. Yeah. Was the plan. This was the end game. So uh -huh. I'll yeah. say, I saw your interview with Chris young and it was really good. Yeah. Good and he job. was super emotional. Good job. He was emotional. I yeah. think anybody that watched that interview could tell that this wasn't something where yeah, like he a, was ready to get him out of there so he could start. Yeah. you know, laying down the gavel or whatever. Like it's been kind of hard on everybody the way it went down, yeah. but maybe for the betterment of the whole organization, 
maybe this is what th- they just felt needed. To and happen. those were questions that people had like, yeah. Oh, is he you just, were awesome. Is I he mean, you went coming, right to it. Is he just coming in with this iron yeah. fist and being like, you're out, you're out, you're out. This is my organization. I'm running it. I'm bringing in my people. And I think you could tell by his reaction and how emotionally he was that that was absolutely not the case. Yeah. 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 Well, hopefully we'll get him on. Yeah, I hope and, so too. And I know that was like a roller coaster week for I you. Know. Oh my gosh, I was exhausted. <laughs> I came home on Thursday. We had a day game and I just like opened a bottle of wine and put a straw in it. Like, I mean, <laughs> not literally. Well, I mean, not literally, but it would. But kind of. The end result was yes. the same. <laughs> um, I mean, I just was like, it has just been a, like, I just am emotionally drained. I'm, you know, it yeah. just was a crazy well, week. Well, because it's, it's a weird deal when it's like someone yeah. you're feeling for yeah. and then you have to go and broadcast about it. Like, yeah. It's just kind of. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Um, a couple more things that I want to mention um, social media wise. I probably should have mentioned what's on your feed. But uh, if anyone's looking for anything like a, we always talk about like a philanthropy or something good, doing a good deed. So I started a nonprofit um, with a couple of other people two years ago or a year ago. I can't remember fucking what year it was during the pandemic called parents bridging the gap. And what it was, was what when, so when, um, when teachers were kind of like scared to go back to school during the pandemic and they felt like there was all these resources they needed, but they couldn't get them. Um, parents wanted to help. And there was a community in Fort Worth that wanted to help businesses in Fort Worth that wanted to help. So teachers would post these Amazon wish lists yeah. on, on this website or on Facebook. And so the, 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 the group is called bridging the gap. And so that year, which was last year, when we went back to school, I can't remember how many teachers we helped and businesses chipped in money, blah, blah, blah. And we helped, you know, clear hundreds of lists and touch many lists, all that kind of stuff. And so then we decided to start a nonprofit foundation called Parents Bridging the Gap. Um, we secured about $20,000 in funds for this school year. Wow. Um, I have spent all those funds um, on teacher lists that have posted their lists on Amazon. So, you've been doing all so there's lists about 175 time? lists that we touched. Um, wow. <laughs> one by one. Um, and so th- we're out of funds. Okay. Um, so if anyone wants to join the group, bridging the gap on Facebook, there are still a handful of teachers that we weren't able to get to with those funds that we secured. It is my hope to get private donations in between now and the next school year. But if anyone is looking to, you know, to do something good for a teacher, please feel free wow. to join that group and find a list that hasn't been touched or hasn't been cleared and, and do that. Um, it, it means so much to these teachers and yeah. it started out as just Fort Worth ISD. And then it just was like, fuck, whatever. If you're a teacher and you want to put your list on here, we're going to do our best to get to it. So you, so you guys are getting everything that the school basically isn't providing that they feel like they need yeah, to do yeah. their job. Well. You know, and there's, you know, there, I feel like like at our and the school, schools do as much as they can. They do so much. Yeah. And like at our school, like we have a really involved PTA with a bunch Same. of really involved parents. And so the teachers at our school don't want for anything. Yep. That is not the case at every school. Yep. Uh, um, so especially every public that school. And so that's why we called it bridging okay. the gap. And so we're trying to bring those resources, you know, to Everywhere. those teachers, to whoever like the giant PTA for all of the school. Like right. you're kind of but in yeah. also too, with like, without inserting, like, let me come. I don't know if you've, and this is, this is all, this is way too deep. We'll have to get into it later. But if you've ever listened to the podcast, what's it called? Like, um, God, it's about, it's about white people being saviors and the PTAs oh. and all that stuff. It's a great podcast though. And I don't, you know, I don't listen to podcasts, but yeah. I did during the pandemic. Except for the mom. Yeah. Uh, well, except, every week. Always. Um, anyway, you don't want to try to change what they're like. All, all we're trying to do with bridging the parents, bridging the gap is like, literally like you tell me what you need and I'm going to see if I can find the resources to provide that for yeah. you. I'm not going to tell you, you should put some a PTA in place and some programs and do this after school activity and do this like, and do that. Let's cut to the chase. Like, literally. What do you need? You need teacher, crowns, you need pencils, you need workbooks. Well, let's get it. And I like it. So it's okay. very just, it's there's, there's none of that. Like, let me save you. It's like, let me just buy you some fucking supplies. Like, <laughs> let me, you need this. Like, let me help you. I kind of love um, that. You know, yeah. and, and the, in the, I love the fact that it is open to anyone who wants to help. So if you're a business out there that wants to help teachers get in touch with me, um, if you are just a parent or, or a citizen sitting at home and you're like, I'd like to do a good deed today, go join that Facebook group, find a list, clear it. It makes these teachers I mean, like the notes that I get of appreciation are like, wow, so I incredible. Had no idea you were doing yeah. all And this. so it's like that. I mean, fuck, but teachers, who's more important? Like no one. I I've mean, been thinking about doctors. That. I mean, nurses, those are yeah. obviously, but like outside of like our medical 
professionals, I, I, yep. like teachers are fucking it. They are, they are. And I've been thinking about that because I've seen some headlines where it's hard, like teachers are quitting and it's mm. hard to staff school. Oh, it's harder than ever. I'm, I'm, what I'm, happens if all uh, of a sudden we don't have teachers <laughs> in our schools? Listen, so I'm trying this to, is one little thing. Yes. The PTA can take care of the muffins and we, right. <laughs> and we can help. No, I'm saying we, I'm like, I want to do this. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. um, but okay. So where do they go? So Facebook, uh, the group is called Bridging the Gap. Uh-huh. Um, always just message me or reach out to me via social media. I'm happy to, you know, enter, you know, point you in the right direction. If you're a business and you want to help, I'm in. I'm. A, I, I really want to try to secure more funds for next year so we can continue continue to help um, well, to help yeah. these educators. Just, just a, a casual yeah. second nonprofit that now you're just running. A- <laughs> No big deal. Just a casual one. She's Louise. She Um, needs a bigger blazer. Okay. I need She needs another blazer. (laughs) Blazer. Uh, Okay. So thank you so much for letting me share. Yeah. Oh, of course. Okay. This Uh, is your thing. It is now time to bring you our special guest. Um, but before we do, we have one more part, new partner to tell you about that. We're super, super, super excited about. Um, yes. yeah. And we've both had a chance to visit with her in her space yeah. and, um, and yeah. she's going to, she's going to do some fun stuff. Melanie Cobb is her name. Mm-hmm. She's the owner of D Valor medical wellness, and she is fantastic. She's a mom. Um, and she's got an incredible story. We're going to bring that to you at a later yeah, time. We'll she's going to join us in studio, we'll have her um, on the show. but I love her story. I love her story too. And I love when we can find sponsors that really like we connect with and that are kind of like us and kind of like our listeners. Um, and it, the, the constant theme that I'm always seeing and hearing is moms that are freaking overwhelmed. Um, and that are trying to figure out life. And that's what Melanie Cobb is. And like Emily said, we'll have her on. We'll get into her whole story. But basically, um, she has a, a, a skin like wellness center. And um, But she's an established like orthopedic PA. Like she yeah, has had an established career in orthopedics. For a long time. And has been doing that very at a very high level for a very long time. And then she just finally got to the point where she's like, I can't like I I. I can't turn my hands up in the air. She's she like sleeping a in baby. Yeah. She has three children. She's sleeping in like offices, room hospitals, like just, yeah. be- and she basically so got she to a point where it's like, thing. yeah. And she's, she's like, like, I got to take a step. What back. can I do here? And being a PA, she knew everything there is to know about skin and how to take care of your skin. And that's something that I feel like every mom I ever talked to is sort of trying to figure out. Um, and I told her for, for my situation, I was like, I'm a blank canvas. I was like, I've been testing things for years and I've never found something that's stuck and I need something that won't cost me an arm, arm and a leg, but I want to make sure I'm treating my skin right and I'm preserving my face, et cetera, for the future. And so that's what she can do with you. She provides free consultations at her office She is located in Fort Worth. So if you're in Fort Worth, it's super close. If you're in Dallas and you need to go to Fort Worth for any other reason, pop on by with her. If not, she does offer virtual consultations too. Um, She sells a wonderful skincare line there of of products if you're needing them. But more importantly, she offers a lot of things. I just got a chemical peel. Oh, I'm getting one uh, tomorrow. Oh, you are? You're yeah. going to go see her? Yep. I'm okay, one awesome. Yeah, she does all the things that like your med spa would do. Yeah. Um, but I love what I love about her is she's very like medically driven. She's yeah. not just like one size fits all. Here, let me inject you with some, some stuff. Let me do this. Let me uh, have your money. Yeah. yeah. She me- And she meets you where you are. Like yep. if you're like, look, this is my budget. I can't spend... $500 a month on my, on my skin. I yeah. just can't. I mean, if you, if she meets you where you are and she's concerned about the medical aspect of it yep. because of her medical background. So she wants to know about your medical history, your medication list, um, and your goals for what you're trying to get out of your skin. And if you're like us, I mean, I'm not, I don't have a huge regimen either. Um, and so I'm like, well, just tell me what you think would make this all look better. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. we'll get after it. Exactly. You know? Somebody that you can trust. Um, I called her like a skin concierge. Yeah, like, I love that. It's like, okay, look at this and what do I need? And here's my budget. And she will do it for you. They offer all of the things, chemical peels, microneedling, natural hair restoration, dermal fillers, Botox. Yes, she will do that for you. Disport, um, Sculptra, Kibella. Kybella. Kybella, which is working on the fat below your chin. No, I'm like... 
I never thought of that, but yeah. maybe I should. Um, and so much more. She can, it's like a one-stop shop for everything that you need. So please go see Melanie. Yeah. And we both had a consultation we at did. the same time. It took like, you know, 10, 15 Super. minutes each. And yeah. And then she was like, okay, let's start with this. Let's start with a chemical peel for you. I'll start with a chemical peel for you. And she then we'll shoots you straight. go from there. And I love this. So we were leaving the meeting and we both forgot to ask, like, how do you say this? Cause it's D I V A L O R E. Mm-hmm. And um, so she sent me a voice text and she's like, this is way easier to do by voice text. And so it's D Valor, which is Italian for worth. Mm-hmm. And so for her, she's Italian and it was important for her. Like this is a big thing for her, um, you know, to, to know your worth and know yep. your, she was so run down in her regular nine to five, which wasn't even a nine to five. It was like a eight to eight. Yep. Um, and so she was, she thought this was important and she named it that. And I think it's fantastic. And we are so excited to have her on board, um, as a sponsor of the mom game and can't wait to get her in studio so she can tell us more of her story. Cause yep. she's really, she was really honest. The very first time I talked to her, we didn't know each other. And, um, she just kind of laid it all out. She I was love like, it. yeah, I was on the verge of a breakdown. And, um, it, anyway, it, it's, it's fun to connect with you know, spawn people, people like and that. And she listened to the show and I think I know, that's why and she that's, feels like she can tell yeah, us anything. And it makes us feel us good. I know. Because uh, we are good. all borderline and, breakdown. Right, because we're all, cause <laughs> we're, the time. she's probably like, I can talk to these girls. Look at them. They're a fucking disaster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't can, welcome uh, me with open arms. Exactly. We don't have to have some like big marketing department and no like, judgment some, here. Yeah, like let's just all be real. Like what do you need? How can we help you? How can we help right. each other? And yeah. that's what we do. If If you know somebody wants to sponsor or you maybe have a business too. That's kind of our deal here in case you haven't noticed. Um, so Divalor Medical Wellness, D-I-V-A-L-O-R-E, Divalor Medical Wellness.com if you want to book that free consultation um, with Melanie. And we will also link it in our link tree. So you go to our Twitter, you go to our Instagram and you go to that link tree and you will see how to find Melanie and her business. Highly, highly recommend. Yeah. Thanks, Melanie. Welcome aboard, Divalor. Um, let's get to it. Yep. You ready? I'm ready. And here she is, my girl, Jane Slater of NFL Network fame. Uh, so thrilled that you're here. This is a busy time for you gearing up for football season. So thanks for taking some time to spend with me. Of course, I love spending it with you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've told the story to some people uh, before, but, you know, I was working on at Lifetime Fitness right out of college and didn't have a job yet and sent my tapes to everywhere, VHS tapes to Banger Maine, and it was King Scoville. VHS tapes. <laughs> yes. That's how old we are. That's... And he reached out to you and asked you if you would mind helping me, and you had never met me, Yeah. and you allowed me to come out to Lubbock, and I was staying basically in a frat house yeah. for two days, and you had a guest bedroom, and you said, stay with me, and you would stay out until 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. That's when Mike Leach was the head coach, uh-huh. and we shouted him, and you put together such a kick-ass resume tape for me and helped me get my first job in Tyler. So yeah. I am forever in debt to you. Yeah, it's so crazy the way the way we met. And then now here we are, how many ever years later, and you're effing crushing it. I'm so proud of you. Well, same. I mean, I think you've shown me the longevity in this business because I think as a woman that we've seen flashes in the pan, mm-hmm. uh, but it is really hard to have longevity in this business. And I think there are a few women that I really look up to, and you've been one of them that is... Sh- that has shown you that you can not only have it all, but you can also have a family. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of women that have struggled with that balance as well. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, it's definitely not easy. There's a lot of juggling that goes on. Um, but it's definitely worth it. I mean, I didn't ever, I mean, my, my priorities changed when I got married and had kids, but it, it's, it's definitely still something that motivates me, drives me. Um, and it's something I still love to do. Okay. I want to talk about, I want to talk about you, what kind of your journey, it all started in that the little <laughs> three bedroom house. And Lubbock when we put together that resume tape for you. Yes. She had the van. I don't know if you've talked about that on it here. Was but it, it was a Taurus. It was a Ford Taurus. Taurus. But it had this awesome wrap and it was EJ Sports and all the, like Cliff Kingsbury, who's a very good friend, you know, now we joke about, it. oh, EJ, oh, EJ gosh. Sports. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you always showed me this, the ability to have relationships with these guys and still be a journalist. And I remember when you came to Dallas you know, some of these curmudgeon reporters, oh, she's so friendly with the guys and blah, huh? blah, blah. Or she sticks up the coach. Jay Glazer does that in the NFL. Yeah. And that's why he's so good as a job. You can be an object, objective journalist, 
But it's not rocket science. These are not State Department secrets that we're talking about. And I think the people that are really good in this business are the ones that have good relationships. And I feel like it, it, it was such a huge part of me. And I, it wasn't something I was willing to budge on. It really wasn't. Like, I was like, okay, I, I, I realize that this isn't a traditional approach to journalism and all that kind of stuff. But I felt like, you know... Am I going to get, am I, you know, when I was covering tech, am I going to say that tech won and beat Baylor when they lost you know, <laughs> 70 to three, or am I going to try to pretend like they played great? No. I mean, and, and did those guys or anybody care when I criticize them or no. whatever? They don't, they realize it's, it's right. in bounds, right? Yes. Yes. And they, they realize, I mean, it's not like, I mean, these, these are smart dudes. They know what's going on. They know if they're playing like shit, they know if they're playing good. I mean, I, I don't feel like anybody's going to, you know, take my opinion or thoughts over over anybody else's you know what I mean I just don't it just I just that was always a very big part of it's my personality it's um but it was authentic and yeah. I think that's what Thank I you. loved about you and it's why you know I'm, I'm dressed in golf gear because I'm going to play with old Derek Hall and our boy and oh, he was like Derek. tell mom I said hi <laughs> tell mom I said hi <laughs> and so that's these guys boy. love you and I always appreciate you know, guys that I used to cover, the Jason Hatchers of the world, the Orlando Scandricks, the Bryce Butlers, like when they see me, we are authentically happy to see each other. You know, it's your objective as a journalist, but as a human, you know, you invest in their family, like Randall Cobb's family, love his family. When I go up there to Green Bay, his wife, Ida was like, you have to come by the house. Like, I appreciate those relationships because you are asking them in some cases, particularly with my job, to share very personal information about their job, their salary, transactions, their injuries. Why wouldn't you have a relation? Why right. would I give you anything if I don't have a relationship with you? And you know what? It's, it's I enjoy that. It's not like Same. I'm like, oh, I've got to build this relationship. I've got to, I mean, I enjoy that. Not yes. even just in my job, but in, in life in general. That's just, that's kind of my jam. And so I, I don't feel like that has ever been a, a negative, at least in my eyes. It has been in some others' eyes. Um, well, that's that why I considered you one of the sort of trailblazers here in Dallas. And I remember when he first got on the Rangers, I think there was, I was at the fan and I think there was some debate back then about it. And I remember on the radio saying, why is this a problem again? Right. It's just the insinuation right. that because there's a relationship, there's clearly got to be some, some other relationship dynamic, right. which drives me insane. There's something else going on. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it, it, like I said, it's, it's something I just wasn't willing to budge on. And I, I'm, I mean, I've, I, I'm so proud of you and, and what you've done. We've kind of haven't really exactly spelled out what you, what you <laughs> exactly do. You work for the NFL network, you cover the Cowboys. Um, that's not an easy thing. <laughs> I would assume. I mean, I covered them for a hot second when I first got here, but not like exclusively and not in depth like you do. What, how long have you been doing that beat specifically? So wait, wait, let's start with, okay, Tyler first. Yep. Lubbock, Lubbock, my house, my house in Lubbock, yep. then to Tyler, then. So my first job in Tyler, I wasn't even on TV. In fact, uh, they told me that I needed a lot of work. So I started out <laughs> as a producer for a year, which honestly for me, looking back, it makes you appreciate everyone that contributes to putting the on-air product and it also makes me a lot more thoughtful when I'm at a news conference or um, covering a story. Oh, here's the angles. Here's how to build graphics. Um, bottom line, this. Like, I'm speaking a language that endears me to my bosses that some people in the field haven't done. Just like I appreciate my bosses who've worked in the field and are now on the other side. And so that was a challenging year, though, because, you know, I sent tapes everywhere. Banger Maine didn't even want me. Banger Maine. Uh, but then I, I sort of worked my way up, and then we got a new news director, and he wanted me to launch the investigative department. So I did hard news in Tyler. Then I went to Denver and hard, did hard news. It's I came brutal, back to Dallas. It? Oh, yeah. Hard news. I did it for Not, two years. Was yeah, you knock brutal. on doors, oh. and, you know, you're you're you get excited about sharing somebody's grief. Yeah. And that's when I like, I started internalizing. This is not the person I want to be. I didn't, I didn't like that. There was a competitive level to share grief. And so that's when I started really kind of getting in my head. I want to pivot. So I came back here to Dallas and I mean, I did everything when I, I got to Dallas cause I left Denver and, um, I was doing traffic. I was and doing you news married and anchor. divorced in Denver. Yes. Well, I met, he was the sports director in, okay. in Tyler. So, you know, in the small markets when bars close at 11 and the dating scene is, you know, even though I was a year, a year and a half there and I would come back and forth to Dallas. Um, it's 
it's this strange dynamic where I imagine like when you do reality TV and you're on an island, you know, like Survivor and sometimes the castmates fall in love. I get that because that's kind of what it felt like. You were on an island. Uh, but, you know, the fact that we both wanted to do TV did not work. Yeah. Uh, you know, we actually didn't speak for 11 years after that. Um, and we spoke during COVID, during the pandemic. And now we're great friends and he works in Montana. He's a, a TV manager and he loves it but I think sometimes he looks up and he sees you know me doing things at the NFL network and he was the one one of the ones when he hired me was like yeah you need some work and I remind him of that right I said thank you for the chip on my shoulder um but yeah so that's the best piece of advice is sometimes it's not great for two people who want to be in the spotlight Mm -hmm. (laughs) to get married (laughs) um well I'm glad you guys are friends now yeah that's good I mean you know you don't ever I mean you shared a significant you know, I got Not married at 26, divorced at 27. Even my family oh, sometimes that forgets, forgets. Yeah. Um, that I was married. We all just say it was one hell of a party. There we I didn't <laughs> realize it was that it was that brief. Yeah, I mean, Denver was tough. He worked, you know, the evening shift. I worked the morning shift. So we were like two ships crossing in the night. And, you know, we bought a house and we were kind of in over our heads. And so I just think everything's piled on. And then we had seven blizzards back to back in Denver. And oh, so yeah. I just remember it literally felt like a, what is it? The shining where you, you find yourself sort of going mad, um, inside the house. And so looking back, I mean, God, we're deep diving here. I probably would have done a lot of things different, but yeah, we're good friends. And if anything, I think it was because I felt like perhaps my career was on hold when I got married. Mm-hmm. I think it really propelled me to just go all in on my career and it served me well, but now at 41, I kind of wish I'd had a little bit more balance and maybe spend a little bit more time on my personal life. Yeah. It's hard because you're going after it, right? You're going so hard. Yeah. That's uh, that's your, your sole focus. I mean, I didn't get married until I was 32. Um, and you know, I had planned, you know, small town, West Texas girl, I was going to get married at 26 and then have my first child at 28 and then blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, and then life happens and you figure it out. But, uh, and don't you find some time, at least this has been my experience, you have to sort of be this alpha tough female oh, for in this sure. business. Like you talked about how hard is it covering the Cowboys beat? I mean, I'm competing with not just local beat, but all the national guys. And even the coaches that come here say, this is playoff media here week in and week out. And so I think the challenge for me in my relationships is adopting more of a feminine style because there is such a masculine energy about me to succeed in this line of work. And so, you know, my current beau, (laughs) we're on and off like this. That's been a challenge for me. And that's something that I've had to work on because I just don't think that that dynamic works for any man, no matter how secure they are. Yeah. You know, you, you, you need this balance of masculine feminine energy. And I don't know about you, Emily. I mean, I get the sense you've got a little bit of masculine energy too. That's been a dynamic I've had to work on. Yeah. Well, and I think you automatically, it's like, I feel like even in, not even just in my professional life, but in my personal life, I'm always on the defensive. Like I'm always, I am ready. Like you want to come at me? Yes. I I got you. Like come at me. Yes. See what you get. You know, it's like, and it's kind of a, it's cause you're just, you feel like you just, you have this front up. Like I've got to be, I've got to be tough. I've got to be smart. I've got to, you know, and so, you know, I've always got to be on the lookout for, you know, somebody trying to get me or knock me down or whatever. And I think I've started to kind of let that go more, um, the older that I've gotten and I probably the closer to retirement that I get. (laughs) Um, but it is, it's so important that like when I met my husband, first of all, he didn't, he was not impressed by my job. He thought I was great. He thought he thinks I'm great, whatever, but he was not like overly impressed by it, which I had dated guys that were way too like into it. And I was like, eh, I'm not, not really feeling this. And so that would be my, like, I always tell, you know, girls or women or whatever that are in this industry. I'm like, just be careful. It's the same way with like professional athletes. Like you gotta be careful who's coming after you and what their motives are and all that kind of stuff. And are they, do they think it's cool that you're on TV or whatever? Um, and I think that's what I love about, you know, my person is he's seen the hard work that I put into the job. Like he knows who I am sort of, away from the TV. I think, you know, like anyone, even you meet some of these athletes, I mean, people, you know, hero worship them and then you meet them and they're just normal. They put on their pants the same way. If anything, they're just, they're even more complicated than most because of what it takes for them to get to a certain place. And they're no different than us. And so, you know, to your point in dating, yeah, I've sort of, you know, it's almost like you're sort of a novelty 
mm-hmm. you know, this is fun to date this person. They like the idea of you, but not you. And so that can be frustrating. And that's what I, like I said, I appreciate my person. If anything, I've learned a lot of things I've got to work on. And I think a lot of it was career and some of the residual, you know, you've got people coming at you, you know, right. when you work, when, when I worked in radio, I can't tell you, and I did a sports talk show in Dallas, it was like this, we would get these fan texts and it was like up to the minute trolling. Oh yeah. And I went home in tears so many days and you kind of have imposter syndrome. Well, maybe they're right. Maybe I don't deserve this job. Maybe I'm not good enough. And you, you, I found myself sort of manifesting. I hope I get fired. And I ultimately, they decided to move on from the show. Um, I just felt more natural in TV. Now I could go back to radio and it'd be, you know, no problem for me. Uh, But I think there's some of that, that, that bleeds into your dating life, unfortunately, uh, with, you know, and I I think it's no different than a cop who goes to work and has to be a certain way or an attorney or a pro, you know, it's just, I'm not saying it's unique to our profession. Uh, but there are certain personality traits that make us great at what we do and then have us struggling in our personal lives. And I, I feel like too, there, I mean, there, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, what I've learned with Mike, with my husband is that I, he's just kind of my safe space. And before it was my dad and he, after my dad died and mm-hmm. it's funny, Julie and I talked about this, um, a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, it took me a while to realize that my, I needed Mike to kind of be what my dad was. Mm-hmm. And he didn't know that. And it's not that he, he was, he's great and he's always been great, but it's like, I need this extra little layer from you that I was not getting anymore because my daddy was gone. Um, so I think that, you know, being, once you reach, like, I feel like you're in a re- really good spot as far as like being self-aware and like realize self realizations. And I think that's one of the great things about being established and achieving what you've achieved and being content. I like, for me, I'm totally content with my career, my professional life, all that kind of stuff. And if it ended tomorrow, I, it would have been a great run and I'm proud of what I've done. And so once you get to that point, you just feel like you can kind of like Breathe. let it all go. Yes. Yeah. You know, I was saying, I was actually, you and I are always like right here. That's why I always appreciate talking to you. Um, You know, I feel the same way with the exception of the good morning football job, which, you know, I was, that was the one job I would probably have left Dallas for. I feel a great privilege of covering this team that I grew up on. You know, my, my family, you know, watched it. My grandmother was actually the biggest Cowboys fan slash hater in the family. I I always joke that if the sky was falling, it was Jerry Jones's fault, according, (laughs) you know, to Jane Shockley. Um, and so to be able to, you know, sometimes I have to pinch myself that, you know, I can reach out to Steven or I see Jerry and we have such a good time together, or, you know, I'm able to call people and get inside information. I pinch myself going, how is this my life? And that's exciting to me. But to your point, if Dallas is, I would love to have Shereen Williams career, put me in the Texas hall of fame of broadcasting and have people reflect back on my career. She had a really, she did a really great job covering that beat. And because she did such a good job, we hired other females to do it. That for me is a legacy I'd be very, very proud of. But to your point, I think you also find yourself going, what other areas of my life have I neglected Mm -hmm. that maybe now I don't have to put so much energy here. I can sort of focus on some of these other things. Right. So how long has it been covering the Cowboys? 10 years as a whole, seven years in the NFL network, which is kind of hard to believe. So after Denver, kind of hopping all over the place yeah. but it's fun um after denver you went to came here came here that's right did the radio yeah oh, well oh, i was at oh, cbs 11 right. where i anchored reported i couldn't get a full-time job to save my life though that was like the most frustrating chapter of my career i had a female boss and female bosses can be tricky sometimes mm-hmm. and i found myself <laughs> passed over multiple times and i remember doing exactly what i did uh, right before I took the title job, I was working at News Radio 1080 in Dallas of Sales. I just found myself going, you know, I'm going to go bet, bet on myself. And I remember, and I remind the guys at the radio station, uh, my boss, Paul Mann and Bob Waterman, they're like, you'll be back. You're crushing it in sales. Why would you leave? And I remember like tear streaming and clean, cleaning out my desk. I'm going to Tyler, Texas to make 16.5 a year. But I just knew there was something more for me. And when I couldn't get a full-time job at CBS 11 and I had no benefits, no insurance. I was living with my parents at 30 years old. I just thought there's got to be something else. So I went back to news radio 1080, did morning drive, uh, radio, did some anchoring in the afternoon. I was selling ad space for a Facebook group for volleyball to pay the bills. And then in the evening I'd go over to channel eight and do five o'clock traffic. And then on the weekends I was driving to Louisiana, Arkansas, down uh covering sam houston state uh 
doing all of that for Southland Football Conference. And I remember, and being so frustrated with Dale Hansen, because I was working at Channel 8, doing 5 o'clock traffic, and Gloria Compost was another amazing woman in this market who Love always her. looked out for me. But I just kept, I'll never forget telling Dale Hansen, Josh Hamilton relapsed. Here's what happened. Go to Sherlock's. I knew a waitress that was working there. I mean, I had all the details. It's like he didn't trust me or want mm -hmm. to. So I called my buddies over at CBS 11, and they broke the story. But I was so frustrated as a journalist. It was almost like, put me in, coach. Dale didn't look my way. And I'll tell the story. I'm not afraid to say it. Uh, we were at training camp a couple of years ago, and he goes, well, look at Slater making something of herself. And it was just so frustrating. So condescending, So too. condescending, so condescending. frustrating. Uh, uh, you know, like, even when he retired, and again, I don't care if he hears this, it was, very, it was very frustrating and challenging to me. And I know there's other people that have, you know, worked over there and kind of felt the same way, that here's this guy that prides himself on and tells you that he's all about bringing people up, whatever. I was very, very frustrated with him. And so when you talk about there's some things that motivate you along the way, just the fact that there was like an utter disregard and not even a willingness, he saw how hard I was hustling, that he could have like helped me or tried to, you know, pull me up, never did. Yeah, and that's, and that, and, but you know what, the, like you said, those things fuel you. Yeah. Like, to, because it's, and it's like you, every time you're on NFL Network, you know, like middle, middle finger <laughs> right. nail, like, hey, look at me now. How you and, doing? And I try to remember that when I have, you know, young girls that want mentorship and they come to me because again, I remember how kind you went. I met Gloria Compost at the State Fair of Texas, sent her an email and Tyler, she stayed in touch with me for years yeah. tried to help me get in that building. Well, and I got the, the Heisman from so many women coming up that I, I, I vowed, like if anyone ever values my opinion enough to ask it or my advice, yes. bring it. It, gets, it becomes frustrating at times because yeah. you get the random, you know, emails or reach outs and all that. But I'm always like, I'm happy to talk with you. I'm happy to answer any questions. But one, like a little side story though. But sometimes when they come with like, I'm like, okay, happy to talk to you. And then like this one girl was like, what's your job like? And I'm like, yeah, you're not, you're not going to make it because no. you, you got like, bring something to the table. Like I need to have some, you know, thoughtful questions, not what's your job like. There was a girl, she worked um, for the Cowboys. This girl was really impressive. Um, her name was Brianna Dix, and her dad was a high school football coach, and she was living you know, right out of college with her family in Waxahachie. She drove up every single day working for, I think it's like D210 Sports, not getting paid. Came up every single day to every press conference and tweeted and wrote and endeared herself to the beat. But I, you know, I said to her, I don't see you getting, nobody locally has caught on to you yet, unfortunately. And the Cowboys haven't offered you a job on their website yet. You have got to go somewhere else. Because unfortunately, what I've learned is how you come in is often how they see you. In other words, there's sometimes it's really hard to move up. She got a job at the Tampa Bay Bucks. Oh, Paid awesome. job. So I'm, you know, but she was one of the ones who came in, took the job seriously, dressed professionally, uh, because that is a thing. And I never want to, there was a woman in this market who I remember an intern uh dressing with a, a little shorter than probably should have in the locker room. And the way she shamed her, it was not a teachable moment. Oh. It was kind of hateful. And I never forgot that all of us are vulnerable. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And so to be talked to like that, I mean, I'll never forget it. And it was just, it was unfortunate because I don't know where that girl is now. I don't think she's in sports, but when you've got women like that, treating it it's yeah. it comes from an insecure place yes and i feel like it's gotten better One um, i mean think how different it is oh i mean the press conference rooms the beat all these media outlets and there's girls that are doing a really good job really good job yeah i, I it's but gotten I think you so and I are much the same better that we're not well we should hire more women just because i no. think you and i have always been whoever is the best for the job yes and i think i don't know about you but even with the radio job i know i got hired because i was a female and I appreciate Bruce Gilbert doing that, but it's a little bit of dis disservice because Mike Bassick deserved that job. Mike Fisher was up for that job. Um, and then you find yourself in this weird position of everyone thinks I don't deserve this mm -hmm. job. And you are a little in over your head. Yeah. Well, it's like when I got to Fox and they put took John Radigan off Big 12 football and put me on it. I mean, after I had done Southland and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I felt bad. I was like... And it was, I, I mean, I was on a conference call with Fox executives and they were basically saying like the young, we want the young, hot blonde or whatever. And they weren't talking about me. Um, <laughs> I'm not, well, I mean, I, I don't have blonde hair, but you know, they wanted, they wanted a, they wanted the chicks they wanted. And I felt bad. Here's John worked his ass off, been there for how many ever years. And so I realized that, that I had, that that was, it went into the equation. I don't think it was the only 
the only factor, but you feel bad. I love John. 100%. He's a good, but, but then too, it's like, well, okay, but I've got to take, being a woman has worked against me in a lot of ways. If it's going to work for me in some ways, I've got to, I've got to take advantage. It, yep. it, it is what it is. You got to play with the cards you're dealt. And so, but I did same, same thing. Like, Oh, is am, am I, am I cut out for this? Can I do this? Um, all that kind of stuff, but it's all, it's just so different. It's just like all these things. And I, I think maybe now men have to think about it more because oh, yeah. now they're, you know, it's we're it's very much accepted and it's not a novelty anymore. And so maybe they have to think about it. Uh, but more can you than imagine, I actually feel for this younger generation because social media is tough. Uh, like when we started out, I'll never forget. I dropped the S word on Aaron Tyler, Texas accidentally. I was doing this big investigative report, um, for this oil and gas company and they were, they were screwing over residents and I had literally, I mean, I had drilled these guys at like a town hall meeting and I was really proud of myself, lead story, blah, blah, blah. And they keep rolling the wrong tape to start the show. And we're in May sweeps. Remember when sweeps actually oh, yeah, sweeps and Back then, you couldn't readily get your clips, but the the company recorded it and said, "Add this to your resume." Because when they kept doing that, I was like, "Son of, I go." Uh-uh. <laughs> and that would that have been a Twitter viral moment, you know. And but more than that, it's also the comparison, you oh, know. Yeah. When I mean, I just remember even being in the small markets and being like, "Am I ever gonna make it?" I remember working for the fan and being on Radio Row and seeing the NFL Network set and going, "God, I've sent my tape there, you know, two different times." nobody will even hire me. Like it's ever going to happen for me. Like, it just seems like it's so easy for some girls, you know, some girls come out of college and, you know, Sam still sort of caught lightning in a bottle. Good for her. And she's done a great job. You know, Kaylee Hartong worked her tail off for Bob Schieffer, um, as one of his researchers. And then boom, Longhorn Network, boom, ESPN, boom, ABC. And now Amazon love that for her. And I don't take any of that away, but you and I, I mean, working overnight shifts, mornings, the small market, you just find yourself doubting, whether you're going to make it and then to have those comparisons, those comps on, yeah, and I'm mentoring two young girls and my, I'll, my, one of my bosses had kind of made a comment about it. And I said, this is their reality though, unfortunately. And so send them my way. I'll talk to them about it. Cause as a 41 year old woman, I find myself doing the same thing. And so God, I'm just glad we didn't have to deal with that. Back right. Then. Because I mean, it was enough to have when the email started, they could yeah. email you or just write you letters. Oh, um, it would be a small town woman in Tyler, Texas uh-huh. that would say things to you like, can't you afford a better jacket? And I, I would literally say, no, this month I chose my electricity bill over a jacket at Steinmark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you start out making shit for money, but it, 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 there is kind of like a level of pride though, that like I, I put in my time, I, you know, I shot, I edited, I did everything, you know, I, I you know, that I wasn't just handed anything. You feel like you do. There's a certain level of pride and accomplishment and knowing that you've worked your ass. Right. I think it. you yep. and I have a, a real confidence and I think it really started to hit me probably about three years ago where I felt more confident going on podcast and giving my opinion. Cause even then as a reporter, I mean, I was just talking to one of my girlfriends, um, in the business, we weren't allowed to be called insiders and analysts, no matter how much we covered our, you know, our respective teams. And now they want your opinion, right? Because everyone now has an opinion. Now it's always an educated opinion, right? Like none of my opinions aren't based on information that I've gathered and talking to sources. Uh, but a couple of years ago, I would never have felt comfortable doing that, particularly on radio. That was the hardest part for me. You know, when you're covering hockey, baseball, you know, keeping up with all of it. And then you felt like some of your takes weren't that authentic. Right. And you could tell the viewers knew it. That w- that was hard. But now if you put me on, I've got all sorts of opinions. Right. And so, but, and you feel confident in that because you've been around the game enough. Right. And especially, and that's the one thing, uh, you know, one of the things I love the most about having been with the Rangers for so long is that you, you, you are, you're just, you're comfortable in what you're saying because you're, you're, you're literally, you know, you're swimming in it all you're the time. Entrenched. Yes. I mean, it's entrenched. I that's literally, I'm literally say I like, I marinate in the content, you know, like, and you also have history and context, right? When you've been there long enough, you can say, well, like with the Cowboys right now, this feels very much like the wide receiver by committee after they let go of Des and it didn't work out. They had to give up a first round pick and go get Amari Cooper um, in order for it to work for them uh, two years ago. But again, that comes from context, living right. through it, being there. And, you know, then you don't f- and you start to get respect of the beat, too. Right. OK, so after the fan, then you go long. Well, then I went back to CBS 11 and okay. I was freelancing in um this is actually an interesting story. 
if it hadn't been for the news director there, Mike Garber, I would not be where I'm at. Uh, so I go back over there. I am freelancing. They offer me a three-year deal, but I put in there, I mean, I didn't have an agent, but I said, I want to network out just in case. Cause at that time I was 34 years old. And as I pleaded my case, I said, opportunities for a 34 year old woman in sports don't come around often. If I sign this deal, I'll be 37. It may not happen for me. So I, a network out is really important to me. So they grant it. Six months in Longhorn Network, Kaylee Hartong has gone to SEC Network, and they are looking for someone to go down there. Well, I went to Texas. Um, obviously, you know, knew the market. A lot of people could speak highly of me knowing my work in Dallas. So I went down there, interviewed. I think it was Memorial Weekend. Um, I go back to the network, and CBS 11 tried to argue that they were a regional network, not a network. And I said, come on. Like, if I, like, look what this did for Sam. Look what it did for Kaylee. If yeah. I don't get to do this job, this may be it for me. And Mike Garber was the news director at the time, and he pled my case, and they let me out. And I mean, I literally had only been under contract probably six months of a three year deal. And I will forever be grateful for that yeah. because otherwise, you know, I would have been there until, you know, I was 37 year old. And, and by the way, grateful, but I was also kind of frustrated with them. You signed me a three year deal. That's awesome. But the reason why I'm even pursuing sports now is because you guys wouldn't sign me to any deals when I worked in news. Right. <laughs> and so yeah. I've done my service. Yeah. You know, the time served here. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I had to buy my contract out. My station in Lubbock would not let me out of my contract. And there was a stipulation in there where it, you, there was a buyout and I knew Fox would not want to F with that. And so I was like, screw it. My dad was like, well, this, it's an investment. This is an investment in your future. We're going to do it. And he was, my dad was so funny. He was like, I'm going to put that shit in different uh, dollar amounts of bags and drop it <laughs> off in coins. And they're going to have to count that shit out all. You know, Isn't by it the, ridiculous those. how they do that though? Yeah. Because the, the, one of the main things that caused a fracture in my marriage was in Tyler, Texas, we were going through sweeps at all these investigative pieces. I mean, big whoop de deal. You know, it's Tyler, Texas. He is able to go to Denver and take the job. I had to stay behind for three months because my boss wouldn't let me out of my contract to follow my husband yeah. to get a job in Denver, which by the way, I was jumping from market 120, whatever to a top 20. I mean, that was already a challenge in and of itself. And again, I worked behind the scenes for, you know, six months. My very first live shot was next to Sam champion covering blizzards. And I might've only done three live shots in Tyler, Texas, because we were a brand new station and had a sat truck and we were so careful with how we use those credits. So I just remember going like, I can't screw this. I've literally got good morning America right next to me on this right. blizzard pile. Uh, but I just remember being so frustrated that you've literally paid me nothing in this market and you're going to hold me over a 16, five deal. That is just, it's absurd the way they treat some of these younger reporters. Yeah. 16, five. That's what I started at. It's that insane. My, that was my first Six thirty every two weeks. Yeah. Oh gosh. Is that what it is? It was absurd. It was even... absurd. No one believes me when I say I'm like, I oh, wish mine, I, my I actually, actually might have the stubs. Yeah. Mine was my, I mean, I didn't do the math, but 16, five was my first. Sa it wasn't How even a contract. It was a salary that? agreement. I don't you know. Justify that. Well, I mean, granted it was 20 years ago, but, or 25 for me, but, but that's still, nothing. but still, oh, it was, yeah, it was insanity. I, I how we functioned. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> okay. So from, Oh, I got lost on where we were, where are in your career. Uh, so Longhorn Network. Yep. Okay. And then? Well, then they moved a lot of the resources to SEC Network. Uh, okay. Longhorn, if you'll remember, that was the Charlie Strong era. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it was Tom Herman, but Charlie didn't love them. So we, they just, they streamlined there. And so they eliminated my position, which was devastating because I loved Austin I loved being able to work for them. And I really thought in my heart of hearts, I was going to get promoted the way that Sam and Kaylee did. Um, but I didn't. And so I remember there, th that was like a real pivotal, pivotal moment in my career because I interviewed with NFL network credit to Maria Taylor. I, they asked me, they said, we're not renewing your, we're not giving you an extension, but will you still go cover the sec baseball tournament for me? And of course you want to put up your middle finger and say, uh -huh. yeah, no, we're good here. But I said, nope, I've always been told do the right thing, be a professional. So I go and it was Laura Rut Rutledge and Maria Taylor. And they were talking about some of the moves they were making. So Maria, you know, was a rising star, but was using NFL network in the open Cowboys position for leverage at ESPN. And I said, oh my God, again, same agency. I said, 
they haven't told me anything about that. I, that makes so much sense for me. Would you mind if I went out for that job? She was like, absolutely. And I will forever be appreciative of that. Yeah. So we put my name in, I get an interview and I just remember walking into the network going, wow, this is, I mean, it's LA, your bosses are wearing Hawaiian shirts. Like it's a whole different vibe out in LA NFL network. And I just was, I just knew that that was where I was going to be. It's like, you have this feeling, this is home for me. And so I did not hear from them until July 18th, like four days before they wanted me to report to Cowboys training camp and also moved to Dallas. So out of Austin. But during that period, I mean, it was crickets for about a month and a half. And I had interviewed with Golf Channel. They offered me a job, but wanted me there by July 4th, moved in and covering tournaments for them. And obviously I would have loved the job, but at the same time, I was like, man, I just feel like this NFL network job is going to come through. But it, when I turned down, because uh, I remember I consulted someone at ESPN and she goes, well, you got to go with the bird in the hand. She's like, the bird in the hand's the golf mm-hmm. channel. And I said, I just, my f- stomach tells me this is going to happen. But I was looking at jobs in medical sales, real estate, like consulting my friends. What can I nanny? Like anything to pay the bills. Um, and then, like I said, I got really, really lucky and got the job at NFL Network in seven years with two more to go on this current contract, which is crazy. That's so the awesome. longest I've ever been anywhere. Yeah. But to your, to where you're at, I love my bosses. I love covering the Cowboys. I love working for the NFL Network. Um, and so I'm just. I'm really glad I stuck with my gut on that because the easier choice would have been the one that paid you, <laughs> right? The one that was guaranteed yeah. at the golf channel. What's it? I mean, as far as like it, you mentioned the good morning football, um, is there something else? Is there another carrot that's dangling in front of you? The only other job that I, well, and this is going to open up a whole other can of worms. I feel like working for the live, live golf right now would be wild. I just oh. think it's so interesting how they are, making the game hipper and it's interesting and it's intriguing. I think that that would be a really, I mean, I just kind of remember it was like FS one when everyone went to FS one or even when, you know, if you think about it, like Fox sports, when they first came around and you know, they're doing like, I just sort of love the idea of, of that. And of course, you know, people are going to get into all the political debates, um, about Saudi, you know, government blood money, et cetera. Um, but I could make that argument about NVA in China. <laughs> oh, you can make it about a lot. Of, and so, yeah, there's not, there's not a think, whole lot that's, that's but it's, for squeaky me, it's like, clean. It's the exciting graphics package. It's shaking things up. So that would be interesting to me. And I've, I grew up watching Fox pregame show every Sunday with my dad. I mean, I would make a cheese board for us and sit there and watch. And I was obsessed with Howie and Kurt Menefee and all of them. So if there was ever an opportunity to work on that show, that would be really interesting to me. Sidelines is not my thing. Yeah. I don't enjoy, I, I did it for CBS Sports 2 games. I did it for ESPN. I'm more of a news and information girl. I, I like to have fun. I love to anchor. But in terms of sidelines, I feel like you do all of this prep work. Uh-huh. You, you have a very limited view of the field. You get these great nuggets. And then you listen to the guys in the booth give away one of those nuggets and you're going through your notes. Well, what else do I got? You know? And then the the game is changing and they're like, did you catch that injury? It's like, no, you have a bird's eye view. Of course you caught that injury or you saw that guy do this or you caught it on a live mic. I can only see so much down here. It's a very limited yeah. viewpoint, which again, I'm sure you can appreciate and understand, yeah. but sidelines is not for me. I don't, I could see myself possibly going back to hard news though. Really? Yeah. I could see myself at a network level going to like a CNN or a Fox I just, I love news. I always have. Yeah. Uh, That's interesting to me because like nothing sounds worse to me than doing, I mean, I guess if you were like, like, if you're like an anchor job or like a reporter job. But I would all, like I got into this business because I wanted to be an overseas war correspondent. Christiane Amanpour and Laura Logan before she sort of jumped the ship. uh, Those were two women. I just, I mean, seeing Laura Logan embedded with the Taliban, I just remember going, wow. Yeah. Here is this brave, I mean, she was 26, 27 at the time. Uh, and to get the Taliban to trust you to share their story. I mean, that is, you know, and then, you know, I hated what happened to her in Tripoli and, and, you know, how that sort of changed the trajectory of her career. But, um, yeah, I was always fascinated with those women. And so I just, to be on the front lines and to be able to say I was there for history. And I think that's why I love this job is even covering the Cowboys. I can say I was there for that. Like I was in the room when Tony Romo announced his retirement. Right. right. So I can, I'll be able to tell my kids that and grandkids. And so those are things that excite me about this job is just access and curiosity. And 
questions that I have that I have access to get those answers. And so for me, every morning, I, people laugh about it. My first, it's not NFL Network, it's not ESPN. It literally is every news site because I just love being informed. Right. That's really fascinating to me because that's I that's definitely a road I am not <laughs> planning on going down. Um, okay, let's talk about personal right fast. Like, so do you want to get married? Absolutely. Do you want to have kids? One thousand percent. You do. Yeah. Are you feeling a sense of urgency? Oh yeah, and I think that's obviously with my guy that was a challenge. Um, but yeah, one hundred percent. You know, and I, I think does he want to have kids? He does. That's what I love the most about him. Um, he wants to have kids. He wants to have a family, and he'll be great at it. He's a little bit younger, and so you know, I think for men, they need to feel, you know, a certain level of uh, of financial freedom and security. Uh, but one thousand percent, you know, not to get too deep. But I went to an IBS specialist last year, and I think yeah. what frustrates me is everyone's like, "Oh, we'll just go freeze your eggs." Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. If I was thirty five, that would make sense. Yeah. At 41, for the men that are listening, your ovarian reserve starts to shrink. It's science. Yeah. I can't change that. Now, all it takes is one. Um, and Sarah Walsh is a good friend in my, bus in my business who went through IVF. And then there's others. And I, I, I won't say her name in case she hasn't been public about it. But she's gone through eight rounds. It's awful. And she's my age. And it's tough. Yeah. I it's did IVF with, my, with Henry. Yeah. Um, didn't have to do it with Hattie. But I, did, I only had to do it once. It took the first time. But I had very limited eggs. I mean, very, yeah. very limited. Um, so, yeah, I get it. It's, it's, that's a, it's a thing. But I'm not opposed. Like, I'm not so vain that I have to see my face and my child. I would love to cover it, which my doctor said you can. My doctor said you're fertile. You can have kids, period. Um, but it is, it's not as easy as just simply going and having kids or as easy as simply freezing your eggs. But I'm not opposed to having an, an egg donor. And then my husband obviously feels his DNA linked to it. But to be able to carry that is very important to me. Yeah, it is. It's, it's unlike anything else. I mean, it really is a really cool thing. And like, it is, I mean, people are, we get weirded out by it, but like nursing is, was to me, I mean, that, like that bond between you and the baby and it's, it, it, it's pretty next level. Um, and so I hope, I hope that for you, I hope that you, and I think it softened you a little bit, Emily, oh, right? for sure. Like, cause you've always been a tough bitch and I for love sure. that about you. Right. But you know, people <laughs> say things, same thing about me, tough bitch and I'm the same it's a little bit of a badge of honor, but sometimes you're like, Oh yeah, I don't want to be. Well, and sometimes too, you for like, you, you're known as the tough bitch. And so it's like, but sometimes it's like, I, but I'm kind of sensitive. About I'm very stuff. sensitive. Like, Anyone oh. that knows me, I am the most sensitive oh. person you'll ever meet. Yeah. Um, but so it's a very, we're very complicated. Yes, I am very calm. I feel sorry for anyone. I'm a that tough bitch me. that wants to be loved yes. very sensitively. <laughs> it's like when people are like, oh my God, you're single or like, I'll have these guys, you know, it's like when you're a sports reporter, every guy thinks like a girl that covers sports has got to be like the dream girl. I'm like, actually oh. I'm very complicated and you know, God bless the men that have, you know, been courageous enough to date me because I know I'm not easy. Oh, <laughs> so same. I own that. Yeah. But like I said, it's also the reason why I think I've been successful in my, my professional life, but I've done a lot of self-help and reading and, and recent years to understand that. But you know, I got two dogs recently and I know dogs are not children, but, but the, to you, they are, but the love that I have for those dogs, I can't even imagine what my love would be for my children. It's insanity. And so that for me, when you talk about urgency, like it was already like bells were going off. Um, but yeah, I think it just exacerbated it. Um, so do you have, I mean, are, are you going to marry this guy? Great question. I don't know. I mean, I'm hopeful. Uh, yeah. but if not, I feel like he's gotta be a cool dude though. Like if he's cool with you, you know what I mean? He's, he's a really good dude. Yeah. Yeah. You've got, I mean, if he's like, you're going to play golf with Derek Holland, you yeah. know, I mean, he's not, he, no, he's, not, he's such a, he's, which that to me is the, the guy that's secure it like, and, and comfortable oh, in his own challenges skin. though. Right. Yeah. Because I think, especially when you first start dating guys, I think they think you're going on the road and literally going through the roster. And I want to say, do you know how challenging that would be? literally to get into a team hotel and to have any sort, like it would actually be very, very challenging, but I get it. Like if my, if my significant other's job was to work with Instagram influencers or sports illustrated models, uh, that would be a challenge for me because yeah. even though you and I both know some of the prettiest girls are the most insecure and crazy, uh, <laughs> so true in our minds, we think, Oh, we're going to get upgraded. Right. And I think that's unfortunately, sometimes I think what guys like, athletes are the worst. <laughs> no offense. Like, I mean, like 
Uh, I think it would be real. Yeah, no, that would be very challenging. Yeah. So, but yeah, he's, you know, he's a good guy. He's very secure. Uh, I'm hopeful, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's talk. I forget, am I leaving anything out? I mean, I want to talk a little bit of Cowboys. Um, cause I want you to get us ready for the season. Cause I, <laughs> I, I mean, they're my, that's my team. I yeah. love them. Grew up watching them. Um, but I'm not like super, super dialed in as far as like what's going on. Like what, I don't think what most fans are right now, Emily, <laughs> what can, what, what can we expect? What are we going? 17 games now, like 11 and six. I mean, the first two games are going to be tough. You've got Tampa Bay here and then you got the Bengals. I mean, okay. that's rough. Uh, I think Stephen Jones calls it opportunities. I call it question marks uh, about this offensive line. You, know, you lost three guys in your offensive line. You've got a rookie um, who, by the way, is doing really, really well, Tyler Smith. Um, they've got him working at left guard, but the hope is that he might be Tyron Smith's replacement one day over at left tackle. Um, he actually was working out with Trey Smith um, with the Chiefs, and when I talked to him about him, he was like, this kid's so impressive, and he's made a lot of changes just to the way he attacks and strikes and you know all those things. So uh, the wide receiver group, though, we talked about this earlier, that's the one I just I don't know what to, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, I think they're going to lean very high, like they're going to lean heavily on the run game and Dalton Schultz, their tight end. But I just don't know what to expect from why from CeeDee Lamb being the one mm -hmm. and then waiting for Michael Gallup to come back from his ACL tear. And then James Washington just went down. You've got this kid from TCU, Kevante Turpin. You got Noah Brown, who's always been like a camp standout preseason guy. Uh, but it's not a lot to get you super. It's not the 3,000 yards receiving guys that we saw with Gallup, Amari Cooper, and CD. So those are why I have question marks. But given this defense and Dan Quinn, I, I joke that he's their biggest free agent acquisition. Getting Dan Quinn back to coach the defense and then bringing guys like Anthony Barr, which I think is going to make Micah Parsons be able to roam a lot more freely on the line and off the line. They had, I forgot, it was like 11 takeaways last year. As long as you've got defense playing like that, they can, you can get you a couple of defensive touchdowns. Maybe you got some time to figure it out, but I don't know. I, they did this wide receiver by committee a couple years ago, and they ultimately had to go out and get Amari Cooper. So we'll just we'll see what's up for the taking. But those are the question marks I have. Um, how is Dak as nice as he seems? One thousand percent. One thousand percent. He is. He's a truly special guy. Um, you've seen this. When guys come in, they're so fun. They're rookie and sophomore year. And it's like, then everyone starts ruminating on the money, right? And then there's question marks and the media sort of tears them apart. And you and I wouldn't like this. You know, does Jane deserve that salary? Right. I don't know. Uh. Like, she's not the best in the business. I actually think that none of us would like that, right? But it starts to sour them on the media and mm -hmm. opening up. And we've seen that with a lot of guys, right? But Dak... He's smart enough to know not to give away too much information, but charismatic enough to have this relationship with, with these guys and the respect for us. There have been guys who've come through Dallas that I didn't think were that respectful of what our jobs were uh, and behaved accordingly. Whereas I feel like Dak is, I mean, he'll spend extra time in his locker or if he's walking he off the practice, he, he, gets he gets it. it. And he's just, he was raised right. He's a good dude. And I tell people all the time, you really shouldn't meet your heroes, but he's one worthy of your applause. He's actually a really solid dude, both on the field and off of it. Um, he seems that, that way. I've only had a couple of interactions with him, but he does seem But I, I just wondered if he was, if he, if he allowed himself to open up, if he, op if he allowed himself to be open. I, shout out to the fan. They just did this interview with him uh, on one Oh five through the fan. And they said, uh, so like, what's with these cliches, you know, football players, you know, like I trust my team, blah, uh -huh. blah, blah. And he said that he'd watched enough Peyton Manning interviews to know how to give information without giving too much away. So they <laughs> pretended that team X was coming into town and he played it so well, but it's like, that was an example of him having fun with the media. And I think that stuff's important. And by the way, I think Mike McCarthy is doing that finally too. Yeah. The first two years I felt like he was real. I mean, Dallas is a tough market, right? It's not well, like New York. It's no, but, and, but it's, it's a tough market, and it's tough for it's tough for the it's tougher for the Cowboys than it is for anybody else. And it's I think it's tough when you're an outsider. If you think about like Jason Garrett and um, oh, what's his face, Wade Phillips. At least there was like some connection to the Cowboys when they came in, right? Whereas Mike's a true outsider, a guy from Pennsylvania who was up in Green Bay and didn't really have to answer the media the way that you answer to them around here. And so I think the first two years he didn't quite know what to make 
of Dallas media, but I've really enjoyed his exchanges on the podium. And it's funny because I think everyone thinks we have this contentious relationship, but I appreciate that he's sort of an equal opportunity troller. Like he'll troll oh, yeah. the guys just as well as he'll troll the girls. And you and I are of, of the same opinion on this. I don't want to be treated any differently no. during the guys. Like Ian Kinsler. It- yeah. Ian Kinsler taught me that he, and he, it, it not taught me that, but he was the first one to be like, I mean, he was like, I, he doesn't discriminate in terms right. of like conditioning <laughs> it out. Right. And so he would, you know, he would fucking just dig at me and I would dig back. And then once everyone else around saw that, then they're like, okay, she's cool with the yeah. kids. Like we're fine. Um, and that, that to me went a, a, such a long way in that Rangers clubhouse. And so, yeah, I think I, I'm with you. Like, it's like, yeah, that means you're you know, you're, Des you're, Bryant popped off at me one day. I was asking him about his receiving yards. I think it was his final season and he went off. And one of the reporters was like, well, what are we going to do about that? Like he was going to make a story about it. I go, that's just how we talk. Yeah. <laughs> like he and I are very animated. We're emotional, but he was coming at me and I was coming at him Yeah, and people thought it was, you know, like, Oh my God, you know, he's attacking you. How would you feel if someone was like, why do you suck at your job? Right. Why do you keep <laughs> saying, I mean, I know one of my crutch words on air is, uh, what, you know, someone said, Jane, you're really good on air, but all you do is say, uh, like, don't you have a performance coach to help you out that? That would piss me off too. So I always try to put myself in their shoes. And I think that's something that women are a little better at than some of the male reporters is there is an empathy there, yeah. oh, which that's gonna, nailed it. Yeah. That's going to piss off guys when I say that, but I mean that and like Jory Epstein, who is on the Cowboys beat, I think is very good. For instance, Mike McCarthy was up on the podium and he had this bracelet and he was being sort of short with all of his answers, but she asked him about this re- bracelet that his daughter gifted him. And he opened up in these, in these great, it was just a really great ceremony. It sort of let you into who he was. And if you, Spend any time with Mike McCarthy. He is obsessed with his wife. He is obsessed with his kids. Like, he is a true family man. But that's when you get him to light up. All of us light up when you ask us about our dads, our dogs, our kids, whatever. You don't want to be asked. Like, when I go to a bar and guys want to ask me about my job ad nauseum, I'm kind of, you know, and I'm sure you're the same way. But I think a lot of women uniquely get that. The way of like humanizing and personalizing these guys that wear helmets. And you don't, it's not like basketball or golf where you see their face. Sometimes I think it's really hard to have a personal connection, you know, with football players specifically because they're literally just a number and a jersey on the football field. Yeah, and I I feel like that that you nailed it on the empathy part. And then, too, I feel like, and that's no offense to the male gender, but a lot of times they tend to act like they know everything and the way things should be done and should have been done and all that kind of stuff. And I think that women come at it from from a little bit of a different softer angle perhaps well and i know you've got a couple of these guys on the beat I, one of these guys i'm pretty sure he covered baseball um and i can say this because i i of course i'm just like you i'm not afraid to like call you out but it was after tony romo announced his retirement um you know it was it was a weird day because first of all the pr staff wasn't really given a heads up he didn't really tell jason garrett and them i'm retiring but this speech was you know i'm handing it over it's it's not a meritocracy whatever And so, but I was, you know, it's like, it was not that I was getting emotional or choked up. It was just the sort of gravity of this moment. Like this guy that was sort of this improbable backup became, you know, the face of the franchise, took vacations with the Jones family. And in one season, this fourth rounder, fourth guy on the the roster has literally taken his job. And it really was the Green Bay game that solidified that. And I'll never forget, Tony had flown up there separately from the team and Ed Werder and I had cornered Jerry in, by the training table. And Ed was asking about Dak and so was I. And Jerry popped off and said, you've been putting words in my mouth for years, Ed. And just like lost his shit about it. And so we get back to Dallas and I'm giving this report. And like I said, it was, I mean, it was all get up to the star, big story, blah, blah, blah. This reporter wrote in his article that an NFL Network reporter got teary eyed delivering the report. Almost like giving me shit about it. And so I went up to him, I go, allergies, <laughs> just kind of being a smart ass. Uh-huh. And he apologized to me, but I'm like, what are we doing? Like, who was it? I'm not going to name check him. Okay. All right. That's bullshit though. But I, I, and he apologized and I appreciate it. But some of these guys, like, I don't think they, what's the, what's the relevance of putting that in the fucking story? It was just so ridiculous to me. And I was like, really? Like you're being a little misogynistic right now. Uh, and w- what relevance did that have to the story? I'm right. so confused. That was my argument. It was just so, an- it was just kind of annoying to me. Yeah. That and would annoy. The there's like another big blogger in the business who will make insinuations that I get scoops because of this or that. 
that stuff pisses me off. And yeah. I've said it to his, like, my thing is if you're going to come for me, just like you said, I will give it right back. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm a grown ass woman. I'm a big girl. I yeah, can take it. Like you don't have it. to, you don't have to insinuate. You no. don't have to just come right out. Ask exactly. me, talk to me. Like there's no need to, to so pussyfoot annoying. around this thing. It's just so annoying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, this was so much fun, Jane. I could, we're, we're, I have to have you back. We'll have you back. I would love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's Cause you know what, honestly, fun. Emily, you and I were talking about this because I was talking to a girl in the business walking in. It is so nice. And I'm not like a big rah, rah, like put up my pink pom poms and, you know, right. go girls. And that's going to probably go off to somebody the wrong way. But I truly believe the best person for the best gets the job. But it is nice to sometimes have friends in this business who get it because to everybody else, what a cool job. Don't complain, whatever. And I get it. And I am never not grateful for this job or opportunity. But there are things that come with this job that people don't understand unless they've done it or they've been there. And hopefully it's getting easier for a lot of women. But it's nice to be able to talk to somebody and sort of. <laughs> uh, we um, know we know what each like other is talking about. Session, yes. right? But it's like you you and I get it. So it's nice to sort of look across the table and feel not only that you were so instrumental in helping me get in this business, but to still be friends and to still see you doing what you're doing at such a high level. Um, and to sort of understand what it took for you to get there. It makes me only appreciate your career and what you've been through even more. Oh, you're so sweet. And I am so incredibly proud of you. Aww. I am so proud of you. I can't to see, wait to see what you're going to do next. Um, I hope all your dreams come true. Um, all of them. Thanks. I, I know you've got like 20 businesses now. I love you. <laughs> I know. I've got to get to my other job. Um, but I love you tons. And I'm so proud of all your success. And I am always, I've always got my pink pom-poms out for you, honey. Aww. Always. You. Okay, we're gonna end the show. You look at your camera. Oh wait, what you <laughs> on that camera. And I'll look at this camera. You put your deuces up and you okay. say, "Mom game out." One, okay. two, three. Mom, Mom game, game out. out.